And good morning again. I just pray that I can somehow live up to that introduction. <laughs> it's a bit tough, isn't it? Well, for those of you who are visiting, we are working through a series entitled uh, God's Kingdom and the Parable Series. And we're focusing in Matthew chapter 13 to begin with, uh, with the eight parables. And today we're considering parable number two. The parable of the weeds among the wheat. Now, we're going to come shortly and read the rest of it. Bill read the first installment of the parable. And a little bit later on, in just a few minutes, I will read Jesus' explanation of the parable. Bearing in mind that a parable is simply an everyday, relatable story that communicates a significant spiritual truth. And as we've been learning over the past weeks, in this particular part of history, human history, we live in what is often called the, an intermediate kingdom where we exist between Jesus' two, co two comings. His first coming was 2,000 years ago and the Bible tells us that he is returning again one day. He came as the saviour first time round. But when he comes next time, it's to reclaim his world back and to bring the world into judgment. And so this, this age, this period of time that we live in, is sometimes referred to in the New Testament as a mystery. And the reason for that is that as you read the Old Testament, none of the Old Testament prophets ever foresaw the church. In fact, even John the Baptist didn't foresee the church. And funny enough, even the disciples, though they walked and lived and ministered with Jesus, couldn't see the church. That's why when you come to Acts chapter 2, the disciples were in shock when the Holy Spirit turned up and indwelt them and launched the church. So when we read Matthew 13, as in all of the Gospels, we are talking here about the kingdom of God because Jesus has introduced that earlier on in the chapter, that these parables are about the kingdom of God. And so the disciples would have been scratching their head. It must have puzzled them because they struggled to understand how the kingdom of God was going to manifest itself during their lifetime. The disciples had a whole host of Messiah expectations, just like we have expectations of God, just like we have expectations of Jesus. So the disciples, having grown out of the Old Testament period, they had expectations of the coming promised Messiah. When he arrived, they expected that Messiah would establish himself as king over Israel and he would go to war against all their enemies, setting them free from Roman rule. So you would understand why the disciples were somewhat disappointed. This Messiah king didn't come and do that. So the disciples had this inner conflict, and I suspect... Uh, you and I understand what inner conflict is about when we consider God, about the Bible, and about how it all works out. We understand the rub. We feel the frustration. We feel the, the, the desperation. So, this sometimes in the apostles, and the disciples rather, this frustration often made them impatient, ungracious, and impetuous. And we see an example of this in Luke chapter 9, when a Samaritan village failed to prepare what the disciples thought would be an appropriate welcome for Jesus. And James and John came to Jesus and said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> you see, their expectations had failed miserably. And so because their expectations weren't met, they thought something was wrong with the people, something was wrong with the country, something was wrong with God, something was wrong with Jesus. Let's just call fire down from heaven, burn everyone up and start again. Really? Well, I guess that's one simplistic approach to it, but that wouldn't have worked, obviously. 
So Jesus' kingdom parables that we are working our way through here in Matthew chapter 13 explains in part how this church age, this period of time that we live in, that God calls here God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, how it operates. Now, if you still have your Bibles open, let's read along from verse 36 onwards. So verse 36 of Matthew 13, Jesus begins the explanation. Here it goes. Then Jesus left the crowds. Remember where they'd been? Up until this point, they'd been down at the seaside on the Sea of Galilee. The crowd was in excess of 20,000 people. And so Jesus hopped in a little boat and just pushed a few metres offshore and the 12 disciples and a few other close followers hopped in the boat with him and stood around the boat while he taught them. Now, verse 36 just said, he, Jesus, left the crowds and went into the house. So by the time we get to verse 36, it's most likely early evening. The day was spent. Maybe the crowds was fading away and Jesus said, that's it, I'm going home. And so he goes back into town, into the house where he'd been staying. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father." He who has ears, let him hear. Wow. I would have loved to have been in that room. Now you've got to just picture it. It had been a long day. There had been huge crowds. And the disciples had been with Jesus that whole day down by this lake while Jesus preached and taught and explained things. And now finally they had him all to themselves in the privacy of a room in a house in town. Now, they could have asked him any questions about the enormous events of the day, but no, what had caught their attention? Lord, we want to understand this business about weeds. What is it, Lord? Tell us. Now, verse 36 tells us that Jesus, that when they asked him, to explain the parable of the weeds, some of your Bible translations will have the word tears. Maybe if you've got an older Bible translation, we'll have the word darnel. I'll explain that. Um, the word weed, that weeds that we have here in our English translation, in the original language was a word that meant darnel. Now darnel was the name of a weed that looked like wheat. In fact, it was almost identical. Not quite, but almost identical. And so the disciples recognised that in this parable, the Darnell was what the emphasis was on, more than on the wheat. So let's just extrapolate that a little bit and help us to get the significance of what Jesus was talking about here. You know, the thing about Darnell and I'm going to use the word Darnell from this point forward so that you, you won't be tempted to have this feeble little picture of a little bit of cooch growing in your garden or a bit of kikuyu weed. It wasn't like that at all. This is much more sinister. So the thing about Darnell is that, as I mentioned a minute ago, it closely resembles wheat, but by nature was a weed. Darnell has black seeds with the seed head being more slender and more elongated, which sets them apart from wheat when it's golden or light brown, when it has a seed head. Plus, the plant can grow slightly taller than wheat in some cases. Now, being a weed, for those of you who are gardeners, 
One of the worst things about weeds, and this is what Daniel does, it sucks the nutrients from the ground from around the wheat. It's really happy being planted right beside a wheat. Looks like wheat. In fact, you couldn't tell it's not wheat until it matures and gets ready to seed. For all that period of time of those three months or so that it's growing, the Darnell is standing right beside the wheat, sucking as much nutrients out of the soil to deprive the wheat of the nutrients it needs to produce the good seed. Just tuck that little picture in your mind. Uh, in fact, what was the big deal about Darnell other than that? It was this. If you ate enough of it, you'd actually, it was quite poisonous. If you ate just a little bit, wouldn't bother you much. You might get a little bit of a sick tummy, but it could become very poisonous if you ate a lot of it. Now, as the story goes, as Bill read the parable, the wheat farmer went out and sowed the wheat. And he went home. And then at night time, someone else went out into the same field. Did you pick that up? But that person who went out in the middle of the night didn't plant or sow what the farmer sowed. That person sowed the darnel. That person who went out to sow the darnel in the night had the opposite motives to what the farmer had in sowing the good seed of the wheat. In fact, darnel sabotaging was such a common enough problem in those days that there was a first century Roman law explicitly against sabotaging a farmer's wheat crop by sowing darnel weeds in their wheat field because it caused devastation to the food crop, to the harvest. It caused economic disaster because it was of no use. Now, again, this, this parable was simple enough. The farmers sabotaging neighbours' crops was a situation that the disciples would have been very familiar with in the rural community around the Sea of Galilee. So, we understand why the farmer's servants got upset and said to the farmer, can we go out and pull it all out? And the farmer said, no, no, no. And we're going to come back to why he said that later. Now, you may or may not have picked up on, there was actually seven components to this, this parable. And what I want to do is simply run through the seven components and just elaborate a little to help us understand the application on why this parable was so important to Jesus and the disciples understanding it. The first component, as you would see there in verse 37, is that the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus. The title, the Son of Man, was the most common way in which Jesus referred to himself. In fact, approximately 80 times in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it actually records him calling himself the Son of Man. It refers to his divine humanity being fully God and fully man. It was a title also that the Jews recognised with being the coming Messiah. And they, had, they learned that from Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. The Son of Man was a title for the coming Messiah. And so here Jesus says, Jesus is the one who sows in his own field as the landowner. Huh. Don't expect to reap something that wasn't sown. Have you ever tried to grow a garden without actually planting anything? <laughs> Maybe me. When I was a child, I used to have an imaginary mushroom farm. I was very little. And there was a big pile of dirt out the back of the house, and I would go out every day and plant mushroom seeds. And I'd go out and weed the mushroom seeds, and it was all imaginary. But I understood this as a child. If you did not plant anything, you will reap nothing. And so it is in the kingdom of God, beloved. If you want to see no fruit, if you want to see no wheat, you don't actually have to do anything. Just don't plant and you will not reap. Well, Jesus is the landowner and he is the one who sows 
this good seed. And we are very thankful for that. And that's why we have the gospel in our lives, because Jesus has done all the work involved for the gospel. All that is left for us to do is believe and repent and turn to him in faith. And as we learn from the parable of the sower, the seed and the soils, Jesus sows the gospel truth through the word of God in people's hearts. And while that parable listed four common responses to the gospel, only the fourth response produced eternal life. And so it is whenever the seed of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the word of God, is sown into someone's life, it is only when that person responds to Jesus in dependent faith, in trusting faith, that he does a transformation work, and we will consider more about that transformation in a few moments. The second component in the parable is in verse 38. And this may come as a shock to some. The field is the world. Did you see it there? It's staggering how many Christian books you read, and the books say the field is the church. But it's not. How do I know it's not? Because Jesus actually tells us what the field is. The field is the world. The first um, five words, the field is the world. Now that changes the focus of the parable considerably. The word, this is the world at large of which every human being is born into. It's the world out there, it's the society that we are a part of, it's the country and the culture that we are a part of. And this pictures the church existing in the world, not the world in the church. In the world, as we've been learning, there are two kingdoms which operate. is God's kingdom, and encapsulated within God's ultimate kingdom is Satan's little kingdom. However, ownership of the field. Ownership of the world has not changed. Ownership is still held by Jesus Christ. And although Satan is temporarily and partially the ruler of this world, ownership belongs to God who created it and will one day redeem and restore this world through his son Jesus Christ when he returns. In first John fifteen verse sorry, in John fifteen verses eighteen to nineteen, Jesus cautioned of the world's possible bad attitudes towards Christians. And we don't see much of this in our country. We see a little bit of it. Other countries see a lot of it. And you'll notice verse eighteen begins with the word if. If the world hates you, Jesus said to his disciples, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out from the world, therefore the world hates you. I am humbled as I read um, newsletters from missionaries in other nations, particularly Pakistan, nations where Islam reigns strong, how there is just this unholy, twisted hatred for Christians. Why? Because the world will tolerate almost anything, but not Jesus Christ. Well, let's move on. Later in verse 38, Jesus said, The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. And these are believers in Jesus Christ, those born again. You, we've been thinking over the last few weeks about those two verses in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And those two verses are absolutely central to us understanding how we live out within the kingdom of God, within the world that he has planted us. Now, it's not uncommon for the world to tell you one of two things in this regard. First, if you want to live at peace with us in the world, be like us. But isn't that true? If you want to live at peace in this world, be like us. Mm. Secondly, a bit more seductive, if you don't like the way we do things, the world would say, 
stay separate from us. Both are very wrong. And this is one of the reasons we have cultish Christian communities. Now, I'm not going to name any names, but we know where they are. I have a very good friend who is the son of a deceased cult leader. And his father led a Christian cult that lived in their own isolated community and they did everything very separate from the world. But it was a cult. And you see, where does that come from? It comes from the fact that as Christians, somewhere along the line, they forgot that the Son of God planted us the wheat, the good seed, into his field, which is the world, and he wants us to stay where? In his field. In his world. Because despite what Satan may delusion, delusional thoughts may be, Jesus is still king of the world. And Satan only has this very small encapsulated bit of authority for a very temporary period of time. So Jesus taught in John 16 verse 33, In me you may have peace, in the world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, I was really interested that there he used the word tribulation, and it's not a word that simply means persecution. It means the pains of life. Any of you understand the pains of life? <laughs> and can't life be painful? You see, when you, when you give your life to Jesus Christ... You're not entering into the lovely little sandpit where you get to play with spiritual toys for the rest of your life. You've entered into the war zone. And the first thing that you're going to discover is that as the wheat in God's field, in God's kingdom, you have an enemy and he's planted the Darnell weeds right next to you to suck the life out of you. I should have heard an amen. <laughs> but isn't that the way it is in Christian life? God does a marvellous work in us. And the enemy comes along and puts something right there beside us to suck the life out of us. Not that he can do that. So suffering in the world matures us, it sanctifies us, it purifies us, and it gives us a better understanding of just how wicked the world is and what we used to be like before we stepped out of the world into Jesus' kingdom. Plus, think of this. If you're the good seed, if you're the wheat as a Christian, <coughs> we can influence the Darnell to be converted to wheat. That's pretty impressive. This is why Jesus prayed, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, Father, but that you keep them from the evil one, John 17 verse 15. Huh. So Jesus doesn't want us to uproot ourselves and to isolate ourselves from the world. He wants us to stay within the world but fight the evil one and stay faithful to King Jesus, faithful to our Saviour and resist the evil one. Likewise, Matthew 5 verse 16, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's been one of the pleasures in our married life, Joe and I, to have um, a lot of good non-Christian friends, and they are a real blessing. But one of the blessings they give is not expected, and it's this. When life turns pear shape, and life can do that at times without any warning, have you noticed? Often they will come to their Christian friends for comfort and for help. They don't want the Christian's God, but they know the Christian has love. The Christian has acceptance. The Christian has forgiveness. The Christian has an influence over their life that brings stability and comfort. Well, if you've got your Bible still open, I just want to read you a little short verse from Acts chapter 14. It's a little short verse that illustrates this point. Following in the context here of Acts 14 is that the Apostle Paul had been beaten, had been preaching in the, in the public square, a mob formed and they beat him so badly they actually left him for dead. 
They were actually convinced he was dead meat. And so verse uh, four, uh, sorry, verse 22 of chapter 14 of Acts picks up the story where once Paul sort of managed to somehow, obviously with the Lord's help, recover himself, he woke up from being unconscious, he restored himself, and he, he returned to the cities of Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch where he had been persecuted. And it says there in verse 22, Paul strengthening the souls of the disciples. That's the followers of Jesus. And look what comes next. Encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, just picture that in your mind. I'm a picture guy, I know. The Apostle Paul turns up at your little house church with the odd broken limb, covered in bruises, cut, looking an absolute besheveled mess. And he stands up in front of the congregation like this. He says, take encouragement. Take strength. Get focused. This is what living in the enemy's world looks like. Take encouragement. Now he, he says there, continue in faith. You see, God doesn't play by the world's rules. The world plays by physical tangible, emotional pleasures. God plays with faith. He calls people to believe with a dependent trust upon him that is pig-headed and determined in saying, I will follow Jesus because I believe that Jesus is God, he is my saviour, he is my Lord. Now he says there that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So let's not misunderstand that. Tribulations don't save us. We're not martyred into salvation. However, we are not exempt as Christians from either from the tribulations of life. We put faith in Jesus and we get transferred into his kingdom, but the real life normality of living in the world continues health problems, employment problems, personal failings problems, relationship problems, all the normal things of life continue because that's the world we live in. Have you ever tried not getting sick, people? You're talking to a man who understands sickness. You can't avoid it. That's the nature of the world we live in. Personal failure is a part of the world we live in. It breaks us, it crushes us, it just seeks to destroy us. But Paul's words were well chosen. It's through all the tribulations of life that we come to have this determined faith in Jesus Christ as we realise this is what it means to live and walk in the kingdom of God while living in the fields of the world. In John 15 verse 20, Jesus said, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. It's a fact of life. If you want to be a Christian, you will get harassed at some point. It might be a bit slow coming in New Zealand, but for those of us who have been in the Christian faith long enough, it does come. Sometimes it comes from out there. Sometimes it comes when the people from out there get in here. But you know how it works. But persecution will come. If anyone should have deserved preferential treatment, you would think it would be Jesus' younger brother, James. And James writes in chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I'm so pleased he wrote that, of various kinds. When you have trials in life of all kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces and here it is, it produces something. When the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. One of the great lessons, and I learnt many great lessons from my parents, but one of the great lessons I learnt from them was I got to watch my parents being steadfast Christians. So I'm going to use my vernacular, and I know you'll forgive me. 
they were stubborn Christians. They were pig-headed Christians. No matter how much rubbish life threw at them, no matter how much rubber, rubbish other people threw at them, they remained rock solid believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a treasure. If you have parents like that, you want to thank them and praise God for them. You know, and as a parent, that is the, one, of the most, one of the greatest examples we can leave for our children, to be steadfast in our faith for Jesus Christ. So, as the good seed, we are to influence Darnell for Jesus, not the other way around. Tribulations prove the authenticity of our faith to the Darnell of the world, not worldly ease and comfort. You see, if the world, the Darnell out there, look at us and think, gee, these Christians have got it easy, yeah. it's easy for them to be Christians because life's so easy for them. Yeah, that's not going to impact them. What does the world need to see in our lives, beloved? They need to see that no matter how difficult life becomes, these people are solid. They are dependable. They are leaning into God. I like Clark's illustration of hugging the tree. You know, we lean into God. We hug Jesus when the going gets tough. That doesn't mean we understand everything. It doesn't mean, it does not mean we like everything. It doesn't mean we got a clever answer for everything. But our natural response is when the going gets tough, we lean and we hold tight into Jesus Christ. In the Greek language, the word leaning carries the idea of being white knuckled. You hold on so tightly, your knuckles become white. And you are so determined not to let go. That's the Christian faith. And so the world needs to see that quality with us. And so we live today in an age and in a society of grace and evangelism. We're not God's judges of the Darnell, but we are the influences of the Darnell for Jesus. Well, let's go and consider more as Jesus goes on to the fourth component, the weeds, the Darnell, uh, the sons of the evil one. Now, that's a bit of an unpleasant statement for Jesus to make, isn't it? The Darnell grow in this world by default as sin is passed on to them from one generation to the next. What should our response be as Christians, as the wheat? What should our response be to those Darnell in the world around us? I can tell you, as Jesus would have said, we're to be gracious towards them. We're to look at them with the same attitude that Jesus looks at them, with grace. Grace is a wonderful thing, don't you think? Grace always leaves room for forgiveness. Grace always leaves room for patience. Grace always leaves room for God to do an ongoing work of improvement, of purification. Think about this. Darnell can change, but wheat cannot. You see, once you've put faith in Jesus Christ and you've been born again and transferred into the kingdom of the Son of God, there is no way you can go back. But Darnell, the weeds, can be changed. They can be reborn. They can be changed from Darnell, weeds, into wheat. And so, the Darnell of this world prefer to think of themselves sometimes as being close enough in character to wheat that it doesn't matter. It's interesting when you talk to some non-Christians, they'll try to convince you that you're really not a bad person. I mean, they're not like the murderer down the road, and they're not the rapist, and they haven't robbed the bank for a few years, and you know, they're going to tell you, you know, they're not that bad. Why? Because Darnell, the weeds, remember, wants to look like who? The wheat. The Darnell wants to look like the Christian so that they will feel good about themselves, so that they will... F and this is why religion, and I'm not talking about Christianity, but religion is so appealing to the Darnell, because it allows them to put on the external clothing of good works 
to make them feel like they've earned God's love. They've earned God's grace. They've earned God's forgiveness. And that's simply not true. Darnell will all be judged by God in the end, but the wheat will never be judged by God. You all memorised, I'm sure, many of you anyway, Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Beloved, you are incapable of being unborn again. You are incapable of being transitioned back into the kingdom of darkness. You are incapable of coming under the wrath of God no matter how much you may think you have failed and no matter how much you may challenge God and you stumble and you struggle. God's promise to you is that if you have been born again and you are truly the wheat, you are incapable of becoming a weedy darnell ever again. Praise God. This sinner is very thankful for that. Because I know how often I stumble and someone must think, gee, he looks like a weed today. <laughs> but ain't that the truth of it? All humans are either spiritual children of God or children of the evil one. Now obviously the world doesn't like to acknowledge that, but Jesus was just straight up front about that. There is no neutral ground and there's no in-between status. There's no sitting on the fence when it comes to Jesus. 1 John 5 verse 19 says, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The world, the Darnell, the field of the world is naturally under the influence of Satan. That's why society is so comfortable going down the pathway of sin. Be it moral sin, military sin, relational sin, it doesn't make any difference. So while this is true... Yeah, I love this. Jesus invites Darnell to believe and receive him. Remember what we learned last week from John 1 verse 12. And I know I'm reminding you of some of these verses because they are key to the Christian faith. To all who received Jesus, who believed in Jesus, he gave the right to become the children of God. Oh, beloved, make it your mission. Call Darnell to repentant faith in Jesus so that they can believe and receive, be washed, be cleansed, be transferred. Joe and I and Selwyn watched, um, you can ask Selwyn the guy's name, the testimony of that guy. Um, yeah. So he stands up in this church and he says, For 28 years I served the devil, and for 42 years I've served the king. Praise God. Now, you see, what happened? When he was 28 years old, he said, no one had to tell me how to repent. I knew to get out of this life I was in of sin and to get into the life I needed to have in God, I had to do the turn around, the transform. I had to do the big change around. He said, I understood repentance. Praise God. Is repentance comfortable? Heck, no. <laughs> Is repentance give you the warm fuzzies, Clark? Oh, but tell you, the fruit of repentance is sweet. Why? Because it gives you acceptance in God's kingdom under King Jesus. See, repentance does a work that we can't do. It gives us a new heart. Now, you've got to remember, when we get this beautiful, squeaky, clean, new heart on the day we repent and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, from the very moment that clean heart is under attack by the enemy. And so that new heart feels bruised often and beaten. Okay, time is going. Number five, verse 39, the enemy who sowed the seed, sorry, sowed the darnel was the devil. Make no mistake, I'm not going to labour this too much. Now, you would have noticed as Bill read the story, uh, the, the, the man sowing the, the, the Darnell, the devil, did it at night time. <laughs> he did it while the, the wheat farmer was asleep. He's stealth. 
He's sneaky. He's devious. He hasn't got what it takes to stand up to you face to face and say, now I'm going to destroy your life. But you need to remember that Satan is the enemy of Jesus, Satan is the enemy of Christians, and Satan is the enemy of the world that he wants to lead away from God. Make no mistake, even though the enemy has the ability to masquerade as an angel of light, according to 2 Corinthians 11, 14, he is the enemy. Make sure, people, that you know how to identify Jesus' enemy for who he really is. His name is Satan. And he is, the word uh, devil means slanderer. He, he always misrepresents Jesus. He will lie, he will accuse, he will cheat, and he will try to seduce you into shallow belief, misrepresenting the truth to fuel the world's delusion that there is no God, no creator, no coming judgment for sin, and no saviour. He will continuously slander the wheat, even to other wheat, when the goal is to cause division. Hello? Where does division come from? The slanderer. And we've been learning about that in Proverbs chapter 6, haven't we, in home group? Verse 19. Well, number 6, better press on. Last two. This is the ugly part, but it's a very important reality we need to come to grips with. Jesus said, the harvest is the end of the age, and this talks about judgment. And this tells us that Jesus is going to do with unbelievers what he's going to do with unbelievers from this present age. Gathering to Darnell early would uproot the wheat. I'm so thankful that he doesn't send out his angels to uh, tear out all the Darnells in the world because there'd be a lot of wheat, genuine Christians that would get damaged along the way. And in typical form of God and his love, he doesn't want his believing children, the wheat, to get damaged. So he gives us the resources to stay living next to the weeds with all the nutrients coming from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God in our hearts so that we can be strong and persevering in steadfast faith. Well, I'm going to skip a few pages. I've got a bit of carried away, I'm sorry. The final thing is there, the final component is the reapers. When final judgment comes, the reapers are the angels. Verse 39. Angels are called to do the separating and the judgment in the future coming day of judgment, not Christians now. And we are not God's executioners. I, I tell you, I get grieved. It, it hurts. And I'm thinking of a particular person I know well at the moment who is being judged by other people who call themselves Christians, they actually think they have the authority to be the executioner of this person. And it is not true. We Christians are to be people of grace, of purity, of healing, of restoration, of calling people out of a life of sin to, to repent of sin and to turn in faith to Jesus Christ. We are to be a part of that process, a part of that mechanism that God uses. So, I would conclude by saying, it's much better to be wheat, people. Why would you want to be a weed? <laughs> if you think that today as you sit here or you're watching the, the video online, if you think that you could possibly be Darnell, one of the weeds, now is your opportunity. I call you, I invite you, call out to Jesus just on your heart as you're sitting listening, as you're watching on the screen. Now is the opportunity to call out and to invite Jesus to wash you, to do that transformation, to do what you cannot do for yourself, to uproot you and to transfer you, to transform you from being a weed in the kingdom of the devil to being a wheat child in the son of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. And if you do that, please tell someone so that we can encourage you, so that we can disciple you and teach the Bible and pray with you and be a source of encouragement to you. Let's pray. Father, this parable, like all of Jesus' parables, forms such vivid pictures in our minds of such 
life important issues. Father, none of us like to think that we would be a weed, that we would be a Darnell. But we confess that from birth we are Darnell. We, we are in the world, we love the sinful pleasures of the world, and we need rescuing, we need changing, we need transformation from the outside and the inside to make us the wheat the sons of, and daughters of Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, impress these truths upon us. Impress the importance of these life-changing decisions that you entrust and call us to make. O oh Lord, use us as wheat to influence Darnell to be born again and to be changed into wheat. O oh, be exalted in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.